going to uh, discuss today Lewis and Clark and then the Williams family in relation to that. In the early 1800s, Thomas Jefferson became president. You've heard of Thomas Jefferson. He was our third president. At that time, if you look at the map here, there were about five million people in America. And now there are, what, 200 million or something like that? But most of those people lived here on the East Coast because people were leaving Europe and coming to the United States for what reason? Do you know why they were coming? Okay. Uh, Say again. Get more jobs. To get more time more jobs. Jobs. And maybe free down. What What were they? There were two things they were after when they came. Find say land. Say loud. Find land. Land. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. They wanted land because in Europe, only the nobles and rich people could have land. But they also wanted something else. What else did they want? Freedom. Those are the two things that really uh, prompted people to try to come to America. was land and freedom. Uh, and you know what? Those two th things still prompt us. I made a plaque which I placed on the smokehouse on our little <coughs> ranch. The land is ours for only a brief time. Uh, we own a, a piece of land that was granted to my great-grandfather in 1846. That was 167 years ago by the Republic of Texas. Do you know what I mean by the Republic of Texas? You remember the Battle of San Jacinto? Yes. yes. Uh, when Sam Houston, basically Sam Houston defeated Santa Ana. And Texas became a republic, a nation of its own. And that was for a 10 year period. And my great grandfather was granted 320 acres of which we still have about 57 acres. Anyway, five million people and most of them are on the East Coast there were about a half a million between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. All of this land was considered the West. And everybody wanted to go West. Because if you went West, you could get free land. And that was very important. But people were very independent back then. They could go into Kentucky. Do you remember who went into Kentucky first? A famous explorer? Daniel Boone. Remember that name? He was one of the first that went into that land, and he had free land. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, often those explorers, those people who were brave enough and courageous enough to go into a new area, they just did what was called squatting. They just took a piece of land and began to work it, plant crops. They just squatted on the land. They didn't own it. And then when that land began to deteriorate, they would move on to another place. But everybody was wanting to go west. Thomas Jefferson uh, became the third president, and he encouraged the Cherokee Indians who lived along this area in here, along the Appalachian Mountains, to leave this area and go west. But to do that, somebody had to go west and see what all was in this country because nobody really knew. <coughs> the English and the French were up in Canada and they were already exploring and trapping and, ex and trying to find out what's, what's in this new country. This was called the New World. All of this, the, the North American continent. So he picked out two men, Lewis and Clark, and he began to have them trained to explore. Uh, he sent Clark to Pittsburgh 
to, to learn how to use what is called a sextant. A sextant is a little instrument that sits on a tripod like that camera and you look at the stars or the sun to determine where you are. And Clark learned how to use that instrument by sighting on the sun at a certain time of the day and he made precise judgments as to where they were. And that went on for about two years, this training, and then they began to recruit men and they were called backwoodsmen. And they were very courageous and young and strong and they volunteered to go on this, this venture which was called the Core of Discovery. That's what the Lewis and Clark venture was all about. In 1803, they began to um, congregate here at St. Louis on the east side of the river. In 1804, they finally got all the things together. They had to buy supplies, uh, boats, uh, canoes, and recruit people and have clothes and all that sort of thing. And in 1804, they finally started up the Missouri River. Well, where are we? Right here. Right, right north of St. Louis. And they got up here and they found out that Daniel Boone had moved from Kentucky to Missouri. So they visited with him a little bit. I'm going to get my notes out now so I, I won't tell you something that's wrong. But they finally, all the men were anxious to go and they, they spent the winter, these, these men who had been recruited, they spent the winter of 1803 and 4 on the east side of the, of the Mississippi River. And finally in May, they went up the river a little bit and camped out, camped out until Lewis and Clark said, okay, let's go. So on May the 22nd, 1804, they left and started up the river and they got way up here in, in North Dakota which you can barely see in about June and uh, that's called the Mandan village there were a group of Indians up there and they became friends with the Mandan in Indians and uh, they came across a Frenchman who was a trapper don't break it yeah, yeah who was a trapper who had two wives. And I bet you know the name of one of those wives because kids are excited about that. Yeah. Is it Sacagawea? Sac Sacagawea. Have you heard that name before? Yes. Do you know how old she was? Anybody know? Twenty-seven. Who said 27? That's wrong. <laughs> How old are most of you? 9, 10, 11? 9, 10, 10. Sacagawea was 15 years old. I was going to say 18. But I'm 15 years old. And, and she was expecting a baby. Oh. When she was 15. Oh. But anyway, Lewis and Clark engaged her husband, Carbono, to, to help go along and be an interpreter because Sacagawea was an Indian and she could speak several Indian languages. And she wanted to go because she had, a, she had been captured as Indians were back then, and, and forced to marry this man, Carbono. And, and so anyway, they, they joined the Corps of Discovery, this group of men who, who numbered about 28 or 30 men. It, it, it uh, changed from time to time. They kept traveling up the Missouri River until they got to the Continental Divide. They were in this big boat called a keel boat, which was a flat bottom boat, and it was a large boat, and it had all their supplies, tons 
of supplies in it. And the men that were going upstream, and you know what going upstream means? The flow of the water was coming from the west to the east, down river. And to go up river in a large boat, they couldn't sail very often against the current. So they had long poles, 15, 20 feet long. And here these men were lined up on each side of that keel boat, which was a very large boat. And they were poling their way along against the current. And it was hard, hard work. And they had to work in relief. But finally, by, by June, here they were up in North Dakota, and they decided to stay there for a while. They got up there in, of, uh, oh, it was in May, they, they started the journey, and by December, they were up there in that Mandan village, and they decided to spend the winter there. They uh, could go out and hunt. And hunt. Uh, You've got to remember there were no roads or streets because people didn't live in those areas. The Indians were what we call nomads and they moved around a lot although there were villages like the Mandan village. Uh, Carboneau was married to Sacagawea as best you can understand it. They spent the they spent the winter in the Mandan village, and then they moved on Carboneau and Sacagawea with the Corps of Discovery until they got to the Continental Divide. Do you know what the Continental Divide is? Well, that's the center of this country. You can see it here. And that means that when it <coughs> rained, all the water on, on the east side went to the Atlantic Ocean eventually. And all the water on the west side went to the Pacific Ocean. That's the Continental Divide. If you've ever been in Colorado, anybody ever been, you probably have gone to the Continental Divide. And you go over the divide and you're on the west side of the, of the Rocky Mountains. Those are the Rocky Mountains. Anyway, they had all kinds of hardships all kinds of things happened that were bad. But these men were young and strong and brave and they endured and persisted with the leadership of Lewis and Clark. And finally when they got on the west side of the Continental Divide, they found the Columbia River uh, up here and they had, they had to make dugout canoes and they floated on down until they came to uh, the Pacific Ocean. They were not the first white men to see the Pacific Ocean because there were French and English sailors who had sailed around uh, the South America and had, had come up on the west side over in the Pacific Ocean and they had seen places like um, San, where San Francisco is now and the Puget Sound and that sort of thing. They stayed there during the winter of uh, 1805 uh, from, I have down here, from uh, December to March. December 1805 to March of 1806. And then they started back, going back, retracing their step, taking some shortcuts, they stopped at the Mandan village again and visited with their friends there. Of course, it, as they went through the country, they came to different Indian tribes, Shoshone, Sioux, Atatsu, so forth. And all those Indians were not friendly. <coughs> but they saw the country. Have you ever been to Yellowstone, any of you? Had, did you see the buffalo and the elk? great herds. They would come across herds of buffalo and have to stop because they couldn't pass through and sometimes it would take two days for these hundreds of thousands of buffalo to pass because they grazed as they walked along. And in the summertime they were going back north and in the wintertime or the fall they'd be going south. 
but they saw hundreds of thousands, and and they thought, man, it, it, these buffalo will last forever. But as you read history now, you know that the buffalo were almost extinct before some people like Charles Goodnight and others began to try to keep them from being extinct, killing them all. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, by March of 1806, they were heading back home to, to St. Louis. And they arrived in September 1806. They had been gone for two years and, and uh, four months. It was a long trip. But they received all kinds of honors from the government and from the people. They were heroes, especially Lewis and Clark. Uh, but there was a sad ending for, for Lewis because uh, he had an accident and, and died soon after he returned. Now, at the same time that Lewis and Clark were taking this trip of two years and four months, there was a family here in East Tennessee in this area of Chattanooga called Williams, my ancestors. Thomas and Priscilla Williams wanted to go west also because they wanted free land. And they knew a Cherokee Indian chief named Chief Bowes. And Thomas Jefferson was trying to get the Cherokees to move west, so they joined up with the Cherokee Indians under Chief Bowes, a, a small tribe, and they began to go across Tennessee, what is now Tennessee, and Arkansas. This was called Arkansas Territory or Missouri Territory. And they wound up in Fort Smith on the Arkansas River, and then they went over into what is now Oklahoma, called Indian Territory, near Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And that's where the Verdigree River, Arkansas River, and the Neosho come together. Have any of you read the little, little uh, house books by, uh, what's her name? Laura. Laura Ingalls Wilder. You've read the little house books? Yeah. You know that Paul at one time came down out of Wisconsin and settled near the Verdigree River in what is now Oklahoma and on the Kansas border. Well, anyway... That's where the Williams is settled, near Tahlequah, Oklahoma. San, I mean, uh, uh, President uh, wanted the people, the Cherokees, to leave the East because there was friction with so many white people coming in. But he forgot to tell the Indians, the Cherokee Indians, there are already Indians in the Indian Territory. You know what tribe was already there? the Osage Indians, and they were kind of a fierce tribe. And they got the Cherokees mixed up with the Osage, and they began to have friction and to fight each other. And one day, the Williams family with some other white settlers went with the Cherokee Indians, and they wiped out. They killed all the people in an Osage Indian village. All the braves in that village had been hunting buffalo. And they went in, unfortunately, and killed all the men, uh, the, the old men and the women and the children. The U.S. Army from Fort Smith heard of this, and they chased the Williams family out of this territory, and they came south into what was uh, Spanish Texas. And they went... They located near Nacogdoches. Now I brought this map, and I know you can't see it very well, but I have put some red dots on it. They located near Nacogdoches, Texas, and they got grants of land from the Spanish government in Mexico. And then Mexico got its independent from Spain, and it was called Mexico and uh, Mexican people. And they, their leader became Santa Ana. But they located here around 1817. And that was before there was much going on. 
the Spanish people wanted, and the Mexican people did also, wanted the white people to come in from America because the, they had trouble with Indians. They would promise the Indians, if you will come and get, join our religion, we will feed you during the winter. Because the Indians didn't have a way of having food during the winter. They would kill buffalo and dry the meat and so forth, but it didn't last all winter. So the Indians would agree to that and they would come to these uh, 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 places of worship, different places, and stay the winter and then when it got summer they'd leave again and be fighting. Anyway, the Williams family came there and uh, my great-great-grandfather married a Cherokee squaw. She was a half-breed Cherokee squaw. In 1828, they had a baby boy, and they named him Leonard. He was my great-grandfather. Colonel, Colonel Lynn Leonard, the father, was named Colonel, and so it was just sort of an honorary degree or uh, title to be that Sam Houston gave him. Uh, was a scout, and he and his brother Bill had been captured by Comanche Indians, and they traveled up through the Snake Plains of Texas into Colorado, and they saw what they call the Shining Mountains, which was probably, uh, what's the, what is the mountain there? Pikes Peak. Yeah. Right there, in, in, right there at Colorado Springs. And they saw that, and they were, captured and, and stayed captives of, of the Comanche Indians for two years. And they would tell, later on tell, that the braves, when they were fed by the squalls, the braves would come by and spit in their meal, make them eat that. Yeah. Food. And the squalls would beat them. Anyway, they were finally released, and Leonard, the older Leonard, became a scout and a trader. And I've got marked here, he had a ferry on the Natchez River, a trading post and a ferry. He was close friends with Sam Houston. He had fought in the Battle of Bear, which was San Antonio, and lost an eye. But he traveled around, and when Cynthia Ann Parker was captured by the Comanches in 1836, I think it was, he found her two different times and tried to get her to come home. Uh, in 1846, Leonard, the younger Leonard, got a grant of land from uh, the Republic of Texas. He was 18 years old, unmarried, and an unmarried man could get 320 acres, which is half uh, of what a, a married man could get. Our family has had that land now since uh, 1846. And we have a little ranch and there is a historical marker there on the highway. If you ever go between Corsicana and Waco and you come to Mount Calm, C-A-L-M, that's where our place is, out on the hill and there's the historical marker there on the highway about Colonel Lynn. So, today is a day of history. Did you know that? No. Do any of you keep a diary? Very interesting if you record what happens this day, because someday you can look back in that diary and say, well, Mr. Williams came and talked to us about Lewis and Clark and his family. I encourage you to keep records like that because it's a day of history. There are a lot of things going on in the world around us. And you're growing up, you're in the, what, fourth grade? Yep. I remember my fourth grade teacher, her name was Mrs. Jones. I remember my first grade teacher, Mrs. Motley, Mrs. Bell, Mrs. Graham, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Motley again. And then my sixth grade teacher was, don't laugh, Miss Snotty. <laughs> <laughs> that really was her name, Miss Snotty. <laughs> And she was a good teacher. Anyway, 
you study history, but you're living history. That's the point. Uh, these men were just like you and I are. Just ordinary people that went on this, this core discovery venture. Uh, my ancestors, Colonel Lynn Williams and his, his people who settled that land, there were hundreds of people coming into Texas at that time. Thousands. And we, we have this great land now. And they wanted land and freedom. And basically, that's kind of what we want today. So I encourage you to keep, keep records if you're into that. And someday you can look back and, and see what you've done, what you've accomplished, where you went to school, who your teacher was, and all that. Any questions? Yeah. What was the accident that he had? Say again? What was the accident he had whenever he went back? The accident that he had was that he shot himself. It wasn't really an accident. Well, nobody really knows. But one night he was visiting with a former friend and for some reason he shot himself. Okay. You, you can never explain why someone does that. But uh, it happens. Off too often. Really. Yes. Why would he commit suicide? Well, we don't know. And they they didn't know and, and history says there there was no reason. He was a very important man. He was honored everywhere he went. He was recognized as a great explorer and so forth. And, and, and nobody knows why he shot himself. Yes. What was the name of the person that tried to rescue Cynthia? Yeah? Say again. What was the person that what was the person's name that was trying to rescue Cynthia Ann? I still didn't understand. Who was the person that was trying to help rescue Cynthia Ann? It was my great great grandfather, Colonel Lynn Williams. He found her twice. He was a scout and a trader, and he knew the Comanche language because he had been held captive for two years, and he could move around uh, among them without, you know, being threatened. And uh, Cynthia Ann, of course, had three children, Quana and Pecos, mm -hmm. and what was the little girl? Santa. Santa. Top Santa. <coughs> Top Santa, yeah. Which means, I think, prairie flower. Pecos means peanut. <laughs> yeah. So he he found her twice, but she would not. She she had become a Comanche Indian in her mind because she had been captured when she was nine years old. And uh, when when uh, I forgot the man who finally rescued he didn't rescue her. He, he captured her back and sent her to Birdsville, which is up north of here. Yes. Uh, we watched a little video of a lady, a historical museum kind of thing. It was at Fort Parker. A lady explaining. She explained how Cynthia Ann became so good at riding horses because her job in the tribe eventually was to help train their horses. They take them out in the water and get on their back and yeah. where they couldn't run away. And that's what she was talking about. That was one of the things she told me. My grandfather, uh, of course, was grew up on the frontier. He's the one that got the, my great-grandfather, got the grant of land. And when he rode a horse, he didn't use reins. You know how he guided the horse? His hair. Like a lot of Indians did. His hair. With what? His hair. His hair. The horse's hair. His mane. No, he used his knees. If he wanted to turn the horse to the right, he would press with his right knee or left knee. But he didn't use reins on the horse. And that's the way he rode his horses. And when he married uh, Narcissus Jane Estes, uh, she was 15 when they got married. He raised horses and cattle. And of course, there were, were no fences back then. 
So uh, when fences came into being in the 1870s, barbed wire, then he had to, he, he stopped branding his cattle, but up to that time he had to brand his cattle. And I, we, we have the original brand that he used. It's called the Steeple L brand. Someday when I come to talk to you, I'll show you a picture of the Steeple L. Yes, honey. What happened to all children? I can't hear you. What happened to what happened to Cynthia's children? Well, Quanta Parker became a great chief and finally capitulated. In other words, he surrendered and became like a white man. He had, he had like six wives when uh, he, and he became a sheriff up in Oklahoma. And they, the, the authorities said, you cannot have six wives. You can only have one wife because that's the law in this country. And he said, well, you tell them that. <laughs> in other words, he was not going to tell his wives, I can't have all of you. And I'm not sure what all happened, but that was part of the story that I remember. Anything else? And the little Eventually, she died. The little girl died. Yes. She got sick and died. She died. became a, a sheriff and an important man in his own right. And there is a uh, there is a town named Quana, Texas. Do you know who his father was? No. We heard about it. You heard about it. Uh, there's a town named after him too, and I can't remember. Nakona. Nakona. That's Nakona. it. You know what Nakona means? It means wanderer. He couldn't get along with his own people, and he was sort of an outcast because he was he was what you'd call a mean guy. And they didn't allow him in the tribe. But his name was Nakona or wanderer. Well, thank you for letting me come wait, in. Wait, wait, oh, wait. Oh, excuse me. Before he leaves, I want him. I want Dad to tell you one other story. Uh, when you were a little boy at the ranch with Mama Williams, and what you and Ray used to have to do to help earn your living when you lived there. Okay. When when I was seven years old, I have an older brother named Ray, and then an older half brother named Don. And when I was seven and my brother was eight, my, my older half-brother was raised by my grandparents on that ranch or that, that farm that I'm talking about. My dad took us to the farm for the summer, and we did that for like six or seven years. My grandfather gave us a hoe, showed us how to sharpen the hoe, and when the cotton got tall enough, he put us in the field to chop what we call chopped cotton. Excuse me a minute. Since we were small, younger than you are, I was seven years old, Papa put us on one row of cotton. And we were supposed to keep up with the adults chopping cotton. And there would be 10 or 15 people out in this field working. And uh, the grown men and women who were chopping cotton got 10 cents an hour. Worked 10 hours a day in the cotton field, and they made a dollar a day. Okay? Papa paid my brother and me 5 cents an hour. When I tell my grandkids this story, they say, Oh, Grandpa, that can't be. That's the way it was. A grown man got 10 cents an hour. Papa paid us a nickel an hour, my brother and me. We, at the end of the week, we would have $2.50. And Mama, my grandmother, would take that money and save it. And at the end of the summer, she bought our school clothes with that money. Now, the rest of the story is, when we bought that farm back from a cousin, my brother and I were working mowing the grass out in this field. 
And I would mow for 20 or 30 minutes, and then my brother would mow. My wife, Lavana was over here pulling up Johnson grass, which was higher than her head. And she observed us work for 20 minutes and then rest for 20 minutes. And she said, Tex, you told me about being a little boy and you and your brother would make a hand on one row working together. She said, it still takes two of you to make a hand. <laughs> I guess that's the way it was. Anyway. See, they we, were taking a break, and I didn't have a break. Yeah. But I watched them. They were trading off, working and sitting. We had a great time. We were called the Three Musketeers, the Three Brothers. <laughs> and we hunted, we fished, we worked hard. I learned how to milk a cow. Uh, did all kinds of things, bailed hay and stuff like that. It was a great life and I enjoyed it. Okay. Yes? Is milking, is milking a cow gross? No, it's not gross. I milked the cow before. It is gross. You really did. Sometimes, sometimes it would get a cow that would want to kick. And you had a chain that was called a hobble and you could put those on the back legs they were little hooks and you would hook that chain onto those cows back legs to where they couldn't kick them when you were milking because sometimes they didn't like for you, for you to be milking and they would kick We have pictures on that bulletin board of the ranch. Oh, okay. The smokehouse, the gate, um, yeah. and it is all the barn. Or all of them. Okay. Oh, I see the smokehouse, yeah. Yeah, I know. And they did their family tree for open house this year and they did. Was it I didn't mention about <laughs> Jacob Walker, if you studied about the Alamo, Jacob Walker was the last man to die in the Alamo. And my grandmother was a descendant of Jacob Walker. And uh, her name, uh, his widow's name was Sarah Ann Boshe Walker. And she's buried just north of Waco with El Mott or Lacey Lakeview uh, in the Walker Stanfield Cemetery. So we have connections with history. It's interesting. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>